Good morning. This is Faith in Our Hometown, brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin. And now, here is your host, Father Jay Friedel. Good morning, and welcome to Faith in Our Hometown. Uh, we're glad you joined us this morning for another Sunday morning. I still sometimes wonder what some of you people are doing up this early, but we're glad you're here anyway. Um, uh, my guest this morning is going to be Heidi Foster, who works for Regional Hospice. Welcome, Heidi. And we're going to be talking a little bit about what, about what hospice is, um, why somebody might call on hospice. I'll talk a little bit about helping people through the grieving process. And Heidi's got some information about perhaps uh, some of your churches or things might need some of that, uh, who they might contact in order to get in touch to do that. So we're going to be right back after this Mercy Minute. Uh, don't go away. Stay with us. And we're going to be back to talk about hospice and grieving and how to help our churches and our members through those things. Stick around. Once I quit playing football, I still kept up with the eating, uh, the amount of calories I was, um, wasn't exercising, so the weight started adding on. Dr. Lou is very knowledgeable in um, the work he does. He also has a program set up that has support systems in place for you. You know, you, you'll go through the seminar at first. Um, he'll give you the different examples of uh, surgeries you can have uh, to see which one works best with you. He will also sit down with you and discuss the options, um, what he feels, but he'll work with you the entire time. Mercy has their gastric uh, bypass program here. Um, they have all kinds of resources and support systems in place. Um, they want to see you succeed, and they're here to help you the entire time, even after the surgery. So again, thanks for joining us for another Sunday on Faith in Our Hometown. My guest this morning, Heidi Foster of Regional Hospice. Heidi, thank you for joining us today. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to the Joplin area. Well, I'm pretty new in Joplin area. Actually, I live in Republic, but we moved from Indiana because we have four grandbabies in the uh, Clever and Lee Summit. And Great. Decided to come here and be near them. Well, good. Well, welcome. Welcome, welcome. I've been here about 11 years myself, ah. so it's been, it's a great community to be in. And so it's, that's why we've been doing the show for the last couple of years now, is just helping to bring the community a little closer together, we hope. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people see all these different names, and there's a ton of different hospice groups in town and those kinds of things. Um, what is hospice, and what's the whole philosophy behind hospice? Hospice is a wonderful look at the end of life. You know, we, we are all born and we all die, mm -hmm. but we don't like to talk about the end of our life. So often people are left out there not knowing what to do. So hospice, I like to say that we're actually the, the pain experts. Mm -hmm. We're the pain experts physically. So we have a nurses that are trained to help those loved ones and yourself if you have end of life illness. For pain, yeah. Yeah, we have chaplains who can help with that spiritual pain that needs to be looked at. We have social workers that can help with the counseling and also the very um, nitty gritty as far as insurance. Opening up and, resources yes, and all those things. All those yeah. things. We have volunteers that can come in and just be with your loved ones or you and just visit. So we cover all of these aspects. We look at the whole person. And at the end of life, um, we give that opportunity to truly have dignity, which sometimes can be a catchphrase, but it's really true. Mm -hmm. What do you want at the end of your life? How can we help you? You're still in control of that. Right, and I think that it's wonderful. I, I know lots of different hospice groups and I've worked with several through the years, obviously. Um, and one of the best things always is, is again, you know, people um, like, and this is what I always tell people, I say, I don't think I'm really afraid to die, but I really don't want to suffer, okay? Uh, you know, I, I know that dying is part of living. I mean, you know, it's just on to the next phase as far as I'm concerned. Sure. But, you know, but, but the idea about being in pain, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that scares me, right. you know, because I, I, I just, uh, I really just don't want to suffer, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm sending up plenty of prayers. But if that time comes and I am in pain, the, I've just seen hospice do wonderful things in terms of helping people to manage that. Because people don't have to you know, suffer. We can yes. help with the pain. Uh, it's just one of those things, at least I know in, my, again, my own tradition, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're gonna help people to die and help them to do it with dignity and love and respect. Absolutely. But we're not gonna, you know, push them over the edge. No. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna walk with them all the way up until they, 
mm -hmm. slip over the edge. And a, an interesting point on that, because sometimes people are like, well, if I sign on hospice, I'm giving up. I have no hope. And you know, our, our byline or things that we talk about is where there is faith, hope will follow. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we know is that a person who is on hospice lives an average of 29 days longer than a person who is not on hospice with the same diagnosis. Yeah. And that again is because we are treating the whole person. Mm -hmm. We are helping the whole family. And when you get those things under control, they can relax. I, I forget, was it Dame Cecily Saunders? Was that, is she the founder of Original Hospice? Great Britain, I'm trying to remember. At any rate, I, that's, I guess it's not important that I remember her name, but I want to honor her nonetheless because somebody came up with this idea. She always said um, that um, we're going to do everything for the person that the person can't do for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're going to walk with them yes. because that's the one thing they can't do for themselves. They can't companion themselves on the journey mm -hmm. toward uh, what's next. Yes. But that's what we're for along the way. Uh, to provide that strength, that companionship, to walk with them and, and attending to whatever it is that they happen to need yes. uh, as those things happen. And the greatest thing is not just for the person who ha is towards the end of their life. This is for their family also. Right. And I can ask somebody, even if, I, if they're non-responsive anymore, I know what their big thing is. They want their family to be okay. Mm -hmm. And with hospice, not only do we have the up to the end of their life, but then we follow that family for 13 months. So we're providing them with counseling and support, and we're, we're still there with them. Yeah. That gives everybody comfort yeah. to know that. Yeah, and again, I think that there's that, that whole grieving process is extremely uh, essential to us being healthy about the mm -hmm. way that we let go mm -hmm. uh, and whether we're the one dying or the ones left behind. Yeah. Uh, I think it's extremely essential that we learn how to, to do that with a little bit of grace yes. and, and sometimes helping people through that grieving process can do exactly that. There's no wrong way to grieve. No. You know, except to try to avoid it, oh, if you ask yes. me. Yes. Uh, I think that that's not always the healthiest response. But mm -hmm. uh, other than that, there's no wrong way to cry. There's, no, you know, there's not a right way or a wrong way. It's just how each person does it. And supporting them in that process yes. is extremely important. Um, so, um, you know, uh, let's talk a little bit about grief and grieving. Okay. Um, you know, uh, how, do we help, how do we help family members? How do we help... How do we help the people who are dying to, you know, to come to that process of how do they, uh, you know, of mourning their losses mm -hmm. in so many ways? How does that how does that work? Well, the very first you sort of alluded to, and that's giving them permission, mm -hmm. giving them permission to express whatever they need to express and to feel it however they need to feel it. Um, our society, though, we're not very good about this. Uh, a lot of times, people will call or they talk about it. It's like, well, it's been six months. Yeah, yeah, you're you know, like, you, you should you be should done be with that. You should be doing good now. You check that off the list now. Exactly, ah. exactly. Scary. So, you know, so often people will feel like they have to pretend like they're okay. And even in the church, sometimes that's almost even more of a place because I have people that will say, if I really believe that my loved one is healed or re restored, if I really believe that I'm going to see them again, then I should be all right with this. You know, I will never forget this. I was sitting with a group of priests as I sometimes am forced to do. Okay, so I was sitting with a group of priests and we were talking about losing parents. And a couple of the people in the room almost looked at one of the person who was, who was kind of just, you know, kind of grieving out loud and saying, that was one of the most difficult times in my life and I felt a little distance there. And one, one, of, the, one of the older guys said, well, you shouldn't have, I mean, you know, and I just said, you should have more faith in that. I mean, you know, we, that's the best thing in the world for our loved ones to go on to the other side and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. We're missing each other here. Mm -hmm. Because nobody was saying that, that my, that wicked stepper, whether it was not saying that mm -hmm. he wasn't, he didn't have faith and he didn't know his mom was in a better, but he was saying that when she was going and right after she went, it was a difficult time. It was a lonely time. Yes. It was an emotional time. It was all of those things. He wasn't saying he didn't have faith, but the other person was just hearing, well, how can you, you know, keep your mother out of the joys of heaven? And I'm just like, and, I, and, and we're missing each other. And so sometimes it just took, I had to step into the middle of that and say, guys, I don't think you guys are saying anything that either right. one doesn't mm -hmm. believe and how to support each other, but, uh, but, we're, but you're missing each other because all he's saying is, is that it hurts. Yes. And, and, and you're saying that faith made it okay for you when your mom died, but now can you, can you resonate with the hurt? Mm -hmm. And can you, you know, look at also the, the theoretical joy of having your mom on the other side? Yes. 
and then we were all able to breathe again and keep going and to do those things. But I mean, it was a few tense moments there because it was just like those two brothers who really ostensibly love and care for each other sure. were completely missing each other. And sometimes that's what we're called to do is to be in the middle of all that yes. and help facilitate that whole process yes. of making sure that nobody gets lost or stuck mm -hmm. along the way. Because either one of those things can happen. Yes, most definitely. You know, one of the greatest books I like that deals with that is C.S. Lewis's um, Grief Observed. Mm -hmm. And he just very honestly g talks about, because it was never to be published, it was his journal. Right. And he just talks about, one of the things that he says is, how come when you don't need God, you can find him anywhere, <laughs> and when you do, you cannot Not find anywhere. him anywhere? Yep. And yet, though, he went all the way through and at the end realized that he was going to be okay. But we're never ready to lose that relationship. Right. Never. And so it is going to hurt there. And that's why hospices are such a great thing and why, you know, we do these things to follow and to help. And we also talk about anticipatory grief. You know, you're going to have those people that are in the homes helping you process and get ready for this journey, not only the patient, but your loved ones, and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. There is such a thing as a good death. Oh yeah, well I think, well, I, you know, personally I don't think, I don't know that, that there's, I don't know, I don't know that there's such a thing as a, as a bad death, um, except, you know, when we're, uh, you know, just, you know, trying in denial of the process mm -hmm. of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not really that the death is bad, but just sometimes the way that we process yes. it. Um, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I, of course, in my line of business, I always just say, I always laugh because it's, everybody says they want to go to heaven, and then you say, well, who wants to go right now? <laughs> no. And the answer is like, no, no, no. And I, and I, I, I know one woman, I love her in the parish, and she is always just wonderful. She had a cancer survivor, you know, mm -hmm. and she's just like, she goes, I know I'm going to get to spend eternity in heaven, but she says, I'm really, I want to stay here right now. Yeah. I mean, I really, I'm having a good time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I know I'm going to enjoy heaven forever, but. I want as much time as I can right here with the people that I love. And so I'm going to fight and I'm going to stay here and I'm going to do my thing. And she said, according to what God lets me, but I'm, I'm just basically told the Lord, I want to stay here right now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, then you fight and you do your thing. And she's done yes. great. Uh, I love it. But, but, you know, she just said, you know, I know I'm going to have eternity yeah. uh, with God. Um, you know, but, and, and I know I'll eventually have eternity with these people. But she said, this is pretty good right now and I'm going to fight for it all I can. Mm -hmm. And there is that misconception that once you come onto hospice, you sign on and then you're gone. And you're done. And, and that's not, because a lot of people, it is a scary word. It can yeah. be a scary word. Um, but, you know, we have people that come off hospice and we do a happy dance. We yeah. have a happy dance with them too. Yeah. So it is something that, um, it's not something to be afraid of. Well, and again, I think we, we need to focus a little bit, and maybe we can talk about this after the break, but I think we just need to focus on people living as well as they can, and when death seems inevitable, we step in and we try to help them mm -hmm. with that process, and I think that's what we need to be about. Um, my guest this morning is Heidi Foster, who works with Regional Hospice. Lots of hospice groups here in our area, but uh, thanks for Regional for sending us Heidi tonight, uh, this morning, that. and you know, so that we can actually have the conversation a little bit about this. Um, we are going to be uh, taking a break here, a quick break, but we're gonna be right back uh, after a short break. This is Faith in Our Hometown. Don't go away. You're watching Faith in Our Hometown on KSN TV. Brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin. Well, again, thanks for sticking with us this morning. Again, uh, Heidi Foster from Regional Hospice. So Heidi, you know, in this process of, uh, we talked a little about what you can do for the dying, and we talked about the importance of working through the grief, mm -hmm. okay? What can we do as church communities to help uh, our church members to do those things? I mean, I, I got my own little bag of tricks, but I'm just gonna, uh, this is the broader platform, and maybe there's some communities out there that, 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 mm -hmm. that would like some help with this, so. Sure, well, we are starting a program uh, with Regional to help churches, and what we're calling it is um, how to help the hurting. And one of the things that I call it is um, the casserole syndrome. They have to get beyond the casserole syndrome, and that is 
average, you get the visitation, you get the funeral, and you may get a couple weeks of casseroles, and then you're supposed to be okay. <laughs> and we have done our duty, so we can go, oh good, well, you know, we did what we needed to do. When really, it's not until about the fourth, between the fourth and sixth month following a death that the reality hits. But on the average, that's when everybody disappears. You know, they've done their duty, they've, you know, you've, you're okay now. So trying to help churches learn that there are certain things that a grieving person needs. And number one is they need to be able to talk about their loved one. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised, but people after a while feel very uncomfortable if you say, oh, remember Bob, we did this and we did that. It makes them feel uncomfortable. So that person who's grieving feels like all of a sudden their loved one's gone and they just cease to have ever existed. So we have to be the ones that say, do you remember? So tell me about your favorite memory or when they want to talk about it, you let them talk. Yeah, my, uh, my favorite way of talking about that uh, at the end of, of a funeral service is to say, okay, uh, and our prayers even say this, Lord, for your faithful life has changed, not ended. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. but when our earthly dwelling, you know, goes away, we gain an everlasting dwelling place in heaven. So for those of us, you know, you know, Christian believers or those of us who believe in an afterlife, mm -hmm. okay, you know, we believe that that still exists or that's there. But but we but many people don't know how to change the relationship. Right. They don't know how to start uh, communicating with the person on the other side. Mm -hmm. So they can't pick up the phone anymore, and they can't go over and visit anymore. But I say, you know, that's why we got to get in a different spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to still talk. So I. This is going to sound strange. My own co congregation knows this, but I, I, when I make my bed in the morning, I have uh, some stuffed animals, and they represent uh, all the different, you know, people that were closest to me in life who've died. Yeah. And as I'm having, I'm putting them all in place and arranging the bed and do my thing. And then there's one there for, you know, just what I call the communion of saints, mm -hmm. and that one's for all the other folks that are there. And so I still have those conversations yes. every morning. But it's it's it, you know, I had to train myself to still have the conversation and to be okay with it. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, if there was one thing that, if I had to just say one thing, and I could only have it tape recorded, and I could never say anything else, it would be this. You're not going crazy. You're not going crazy. You're not going crazy. <laughs> you just may feel like it. Because yeah. that is their fear, that they're going crazy. So it's great that you tell people, I do this. Yeah. Because often people in secret will say, I still talk to their picture, or I yep. kiss their picture when I leave. And they feel like they've done something crazy, or mm -hmm. that they've done something wrong. Yeah. So just opening that conversation. Another big thing that church people can do or congregations with, we all hear this. If there's anything I can do, let me know. Mm -hmm. That puts a responsibility on the grieving person. And they, all of us do this, oh, I don't wanna bother them. You know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna ask for this. I don't wanna ask for help. It's much more um, helpful if instead, in a month, you pick up the phone and say, hey, the leaves are really coming down. Would it be okay if I came over and raked your yard? Yes. They didn't have to take that responsibility to call you up, to be embarrassed, to say, and for you to him haul or say, well, I'm busy this weekend. They're not gonna call you again. Yeah. So you have to look at those ways. Get, if you have a helps ministry, okay, who's going to send a card six months from now? Mm -hmm. Who's going to invite them out for dinner on after church this Sunday? Who's going to call and say, hey, do you need me to pick up some groceries or something? But unfortunately, the grieving have all that responsibility. Just look at our visitations. Where do they stand? Right by the casket. And they have to comfort all those people that come mm -hmm. through yep. and comfort them. And it, it's just terribly exhausting emotionally it is physically. emotionally exhausting yeah. so for us to begin to say we're going to take responsibility for the grieving people in our churches and this again doesn't necessarily have to be following a death if they're on hospice if they have a loved one on hospice we need to start then saying what can i do to help you and sometimes they just want to talk about the war Exactly. And, you know, and I always do that whole thing of, you know, some people, people are horrified when I do it. Like, you know, I'm at lunch with somebody who's lost a child. And, you know, and I'll just look at them and say, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. your, your child for the last, you know, last few days, you know, yes. uh, or I had a memory of him the other day. And it opens up that spot. And you don't know how grateful they are to be able to mm -hmm. say, 
oh my gosh, you know, oh, I remember that. Yes. And, you know, and I remember the time, you know, it's just, like, and again, it's just really important to continue to open up those spaces where it's okay mm -hmm. to tell all those stories. You know, um, we have one of the best things we got going at St. Peter's and, and, we, and they, nobody planned it. We just fell into it. Okay. But um, we, we have coffee and donuts every Wednesday morning, every Wednesday morning. So if nobody else has a place to be and you want to just come join with some other, just come on down. You don't have to come to mass or anything, but you know, we have coffee and donuts. And basically those are all our widows and widowers. Now mm -hmm. there's still a few couples mm -hmm. left among them, but I guarantee you the greatest number of our widows and widowers and they get together so that they again have people to talk to and they will talk about their spouses yes. and they will talk about those memories or you know we'll talk about something and i'll say you know tell me you know didn't you have a story didn't, weren't you telling a story about elliot six months ago you know blah 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 blah, blah. and you know and again we'd be talking about it or mm -hmm. um or you know and then we start talking about you know okay have you guys planned your funerals yet you know come right. on right. <laughs> put some of those things down on papers to make life a little easier for your family put those mm -hmm. some of those things down on you know so that so that we know what we're doing when the time comes that file them with me in my office and i'll make sure your kids do it yeah you know because uh, we got one one lady and i'm uh, you know god love her she um she her kids don't like her talking about her funeral and she's in her 90s <laughs> and um and so they don't like it so she started to use code words and so she'd start <laughs> talking about going to target <laughs> so she said, when I go to Target, and, and of course that's, co we start laughing because she's talking about mm -hmm. it. When I'm, when I'm done here and I go to heaven, you know, and again, um, we've had, so, I've had so many burials of 90 year olds uh, this last year that, you know, one of them was always so interesting because she'd say, you know, the worst thing about being old is that you have to be around to bury all your friends. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so tell me about that, you know, tell me about yeah. burying all your friends. So that doesn't feel, that, that, that sometimes hurts, doesn't it? And so if you weren't so tough, you know, you know, then you could have buried, then they could have buried you. Mm -mm. But unfortunately, you're tougher than most of the rest of them, and you're still here. So, yeah. but I mean, again, it's just opening up the yes. space where everybody can talk about those things. Yes. Really, really important. Giving really them important. permission. Sometimes they'll say, you can take the mask off here. Yeah. You can take that mask that you wear that I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's great. <laughs> Everything's wonderful. And you know that it, know that it's not. Another big thing is to not put a time frame. Oh yeah. Don't yeah. put a time frame on this. A lot of times they feel the pressure that okay, it's the one year anniversary, so now I'm good. All that one year is is a point of reference for the next year. Right. If I could make it through that Christmas, I can make it through this one. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing there. Well, I always just chuckle because you know in that whole business about uh, oh, I made it through the first Christmas, I made it through the first birthday, I made it through the first everything, and I'm just like. Yeah, and you know, and I, and I and I do think you'll hurt maybe a little bit less last year, but I guarantee you, you're always going to miss that person. Mm -hmm. You know, the pain may not be as acute; it may not be there right now, but you're still going to miss that person. Sure. And I'm still, you know, years after my parents' deaths, I still, you know, my brother's death, I still every once in a while, you know, I'll be sitting there and you know, I'll be thinking about something or take something out or look at a picture, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden, bang, there I of go course. again. Of course. And it's just like it, it just comes in waves, and you, you know, the waves may not come as strong or as often as they did, mm -hmm. but they're still going to come. Yes. And for anybody to expect, okay, it's been a year now, I'm, I should be mm -hmm. done, and I'm like, well, you'll, you know, you'll, I don't think you'll ever be done. Well, that's the flip side of love. Yeah. Uh, one of the great teachers, Winnie the Pooh, said this, he told Piglet, he said, I am so lucky to have loved someone so much that it hurts they're, they're gone. That it hurts they're gone, yep, exactly. And I think that that is, that is the beauty of love. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that, you know, how do we, again, open up those spaces for the people that we love uh, who are still here to grieve because I don't ever really I don't worry about the ones who've gone on No, you know no. they're on to what they're doing but it's, it's those of us who are left behind that have to still yes. make sense of it yes. it's those of us that are left behind that have to still figure out how we're going to do some of that I do want to put up your uh, information uh, your email address mm -hmm. and uh, the phone number uh, so the phone number uh, is 800 208 5139 1-800-208-5139 because we've got a large viewing area yes. and that'll get you in there mm -hmm. whatever and if they've got a place closer they can do that but yes. but um but that that's because you're starting these these groups for yes. churches mm -hmm. is there going to be any charge for any of no, that to help a church no. do some this of that this is our com this is regionals community service so any church is interested in whether having us come and speak with a group that you have or if you would like just some um, uh, one-on-one that's fine yeah. We just want to help 
the churches help those that are hurting. Yeah, and I think it's kind of important. If nothing else, you can go in and help the conversation yes. get stirred up and started yes. about how we might be able to, to help each other more in this mm -hmm. in this grieving ministry. Um, all of our churches, you know, have that in common, mm -hmm. that we got members uh, who are getting born every day and yes. got members that are dying every yes. day and how we take care of them and the quality of the care that we give them uh, is, is really kind of critical. So my guest this morning has been Heidi Foster from Regional Hospice. Um, we have been talking about grieving, uh, what we might be able to do for the churches. One more time, that number 800-208-5139. And I'm not going to try to go through the whole email address, uh, but we'll put it up there for uh, Heidi if you want to just talk to her. Uh, and uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be right back after this Mercy Minute. And uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to, again, remind you of those things and talk a little bit about um, uh, how we're going to continue to love and support one another in these difficult times. The SANE program or Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner program is a program established to provide a coordinated specialized care to patients who, or women or men, who've been the victim of sexual assault. The SANE program is really designed to be a collaborative community response to sexual assault. It's really important to make sure that it's not just the report or the forensic, but they get all of the testing that might be needed for their health. It's also important to know that you don't need to know if you want to press charges or not. We don't get law enforcement involved unless you request it. I just wanted to express to a victim that it is never your fault. You always have the right to say no and that it's your body. So if you say yes one time, it doesn't mean every time. I think it's important that sexual assault victims remember they've been victims of a crime and uh, crime victims do not pay for those services. So again, thank you for joining us this morning for Faith in Our Hometown. My guest this morning has been Heidi Foster from Regional Hospice. So Heidi, thank you for being with us. One of the things we've been talking about is how we care for each other as members of communities of faith. How do we care for each other as brothers and sisters who just simply care about each other? And one of those times that we need the most care is when we're dying, first of all, and after someone we love has died. So with that in mind, we've got to learn how to care for each other better. We can all do it better. And that's one of the things we've got to continue to remember. I'm not saying any of us are doing it poorly, but what I am saying is we can all do it better. And we're remembering some of those things. Uh, one of the beautiful, th you know, beautiful things about uh, Regional is that they're, they're helping reach out to churches to see whether or not we can help each other better. And they do that free of charge just as a community service. And I know that many of the other groups in the area will do the same thing, many of the other hospitals. So if you, if you work with a group, but the important thing is let's take good care of our dying members. Let's, let's walk with them as, as, what, as best we can. And the second thing is then how are we gonna help those who survive? How are we gonna help those who come behind uh, to do their grieving process well and to support them in all of that because they need it. Uh, this is, uh, please join us next week for Faith in Our Hometown. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for watching. Faith in Our Hometown can be seen Sunday mornings at 6.30 and 9 a.m. on KSN. Brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin.